Hello, this is Dr. Tom Groover, and I'm on the line with Trish O'Dell, and uh, she is a, a community rights organizer. Um, I'm located here in Colorado. I'm a part of the community rights movement in, in Colorado, locally, at the state level, and also at the national level. And uh, Tish is in Broadview Heights, Ohio. Uh, she lives there and has been involved in an extraordinary effort. I would say at this point, it's a historic effort. Um, and uh, and so it's, it's, I'm, it's really a pleasure, uh, Tish, to, to be having this conversation with you. And thanks so much for agreeing to do it. Oh, you're welcome. It's really nice to meet you and to be out in Colorado, so to speak. Can you uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Um, I'm Tish O'Dell, and actually I'm born and raised in Broadview Heights, Ohio. So I'm pretty much a lifelong resident. I'm definitely a lifelong resident of Ohio and probably have only been out of Broadview Heights for maybe five or six years of my entire life. So um, in case anyone, you know, I know you sometimes hear people hear that, you know, there's these outsiders that come in to, you know, push this community rights movement onto the people who live in a community. I'm definitely not that. I'm definitely born and bre bred right here in Ohio and in Broadview Heights. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your history? Um, um, you know, like just, uh, I mean, what happened? How did you get to where you are now? And, and, and um, of course, we're going to cover where you are now. It's really extraordinary. But could you lay some groundwork on uh, how you get, got where you are at this point uh, for yourself and also for the community of Broadview Heights? Sure. To just to give you, and I realize people in Colorado might not be familiar with the laws and what's going on in Ohio. So I wasn't either up until maybe 2010. Um, I was like everyone else and just Broadview Heights, so you know, it's a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. So we're in the northern part of the state along Lake Erie's border. We're 11 miles south of Cleveland and we're only 13 square miles. We have a population of about 18,000 people and we currently have 90 oil and gas wells within our residential suburban neighborhoods. Um, back in 2010 is when I first became aware. I was like everyone else. I didn't even know we had oil and gas drilling going on in our residential backyards. Um, I call it now, I say it's our dirty little secret hidden in people's backyards because it usually is in backyards and that's private property and most people didn't even know what was going on. Um, I became aware attending a council meeting for actually a completely different issue altogether and I remember it vividly, some mother, young mother, stood up at the microphone and started yelling at the city council and the mayor for not protecting her children. She said, you're poisoning my kids, ruining my property value. Why are you allowing this drilling to go on? And I was like, shot. I was like, what's she talking about? <laughs> and I watched her go back to her seat and I like got up after the meeting and went and talked to her. And so that's really how I became aware was through this other um, resident who was so upset because it was happening right behind her home. They didn't own the um, royalties or the, you know, the um, mineral rights there. It was the developer had held on to them. And so they had no idea. They bought a home with woods behind them. And she said one morning she woke up and there were bulldozers just bulldozing the woods behind her house. And she had no idea. So you know, that's how this all started. And she actually, I want to say, paved the way. Unfortunately, they had some gases leak into their home. They had four wells put in behind their property, one within 75 feet of their deck. I mean, I went over to her house many times. We couldn't even sit on the deck sometimes because the smells were so horrendous. Um, so actually, that's how I became involved was through this other resident. She wound up moving after her house was on the market for, oh, at least a good year and a half. They lost, wound up losing like $100,000 on the sale because no one wanted the home with the wells behind them. Um, and from that point on, my journey became just like everyone else's probably who starts in this. You know, there's a harm now that you're aware of in your community. You start doing research. Um, the first places I went were to our local electeds, to the city council. And the first thing they said was, we can't do anything. Our hands are tied. So that's you had need to go to the state. And that's when I found out that our state had passed in 2004 a preemption bill, our state legislature, 
at the time, because I knew nothing about this either, had passed very quietly. House Bill 278, which turned over all control over oil and gas drilling to the state of Ohio, right. which they in turn turned it over to the state regulatory agency, which in Ohio is called the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. We call them ODNR here. Um, so I found that out. So then I did, like the dutiful you know, citizen that I was, I did what I was told. And so started trying to meet with state legislators and um, made some contacts there. Found out, though, our particular state legislator didn't want anything to do with it. There was another one who was from a different district who did come, wanted to see a tour of what was going on in my community, which I appreciated. And at that point then, as I started going down what we call the regulatory chute or whatever, I decided, well, you know what, because I didn't know enough at the time, and I thought, well, I'll fix this. I'm just going to run for mayor. <laughs> and, then, and then I'll become mayor, and then I'll stop the drilling. So that's what I did, and that was very naive on my part. Right. So I learned a lot, though, but what it did give me, obviously I lost the election, but I learned that, you know, the current mayor obviously got quite a bit of campaign contributions from the drillers in the community. He had a much bigger um, war chest than I did, and I learned a lot about our political process at that point, and I also got to go door-to-door which was really great for me and meeting a lot of the residents and hearing a lot of the stories. So I won't say it was totally for nothing. It cost me quite a bit of money right. to figure this all out. But, you know, in the end, I think it was well worth it. So um, going along that path, like I said, I met many more people. And at one of the events I held, which was at the local library, and it was a um, showing of gas land and talking about drilling, another mother stood up. And she was having a well drilled behind her home and was very concerned because by then Gasland had come out. And she started yelling at me, you know, and saying, you know, what are you going to do if you're elected? What are you going to do to stop drilling and blah, blah, blah. Well, that was the first time I met this woman. She turns out later to be my ally and friend. Um, Michelle Aini was her name. And we formed Madion, Mothers Against Drilling in Our Neighborhoods. and was a local community group. So that's how, kind of how that came about. Um, from that point on, as I was also running for mayor, someone stood up at one of our um, talk, my talks and said, hey, have you ever heard about CELDEF? And I said, no, I haven't heard about them. I don't know who they are. But of course, then I went home and got on my computer right away and Googled CELDEF. And that's when I found out the first time I'd ever heard about the community rights strategy. Right. Um, at the same time to that, we were going along working with our city council because they were telling us, well you know, maybe we can do something with you here because we brought up CELDEF when we researched it. Yeah, what that's the Community do? Environmental Fire Legal Fund. Defense Fund, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. And their approach is totally different than regulatory, fighting it from a regulatory standpoint. They believe that we as people actually have rights, which inalienable rights, which we have under our Constitution and Declaration of Independence, all those good things. And I hook, line, and sinker. I mean, it's what I learned in government class in high school, right? That we, right. the people, have rights and we can vote on things. So as we learned more about that approach, we were bringing speakers in. We actually um, brought Doug Shields in, who, if you're not familiar, he's the was the council president in the city of Pittsburgh. And in 2011, they were the first community to pass a community bill of rights banning drilling and fracking. And that that also gave the, the law, the rights of natural rights, the rights of nature to the river there, right, in Pittsburgh? Correct. Yeah, and so that's was, like, that's yeah, a historic they, event, right? Exactly, and they passed it by their city council passing that, and Doug Shields was the council president. So we started talking to our council members because we thought, okay, well, if they can do it in Pittsburgh, we can do this in Broadview Heights, and they could pass a community bill of rights for us here. Right. Several of the council people said, well, you know, because they're all politicians, right? So it's like, sure, we'll talk about it. So we actually brought Doug Shields in to come and speak at council, at a council meeting, to the right. council to be able to answer their questions. We figured they might have, you know, be fearful of this because, of course, everyone in the state is telling them and us you can't do this. The state has control. If you try this, it's illegal and unenforceable. So we thought Doug would come in and, you know, alleviate some of these fears. Spent a lot of time with council answering their questions. So then they were a little more receptive. We had Seldoff draft a community bill of rights for our community and presented it to the city council. We then scheduled a conference call with Ben Price from the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund 
And all our council members, the mayor and the law director were on the call. So they could freely ask questions about this. So Ben from Seldef kept telling us, though, you know, if they don't do this, be prepared because you are fortunate in your community. We are, Broadview Heights is a chartered city, right. municipality. So we had the ability to do by initiative. We have that right in Ohio in chartered municipalities to do initiatives by the people. And we kept saying, oh, no, council will be on board, you know, because they kept telling us that, that this sounded good and blah, blah, blah. Came up to the council meeting where that was up to take a vote. And at that meeting is when it got voted down. There was only two out of the seven council members that voted for putting the Bill of Rights forward as an ordinance. And um, we were just shocked. I mean, we were sitting in the audience just shocked. And at that point, it didn't dawn on us till afterwards because they dragged it along so far. I mean, obviously, there's deadlines you have to meet. It only gave us, when they did that, it only gave us a little over a month to collect the amount of signatures we needed. And we just, they thought, I think, in the end, that we wouldn't be able to do it. So we quickly, like, changed gears. We had Seldup help draft the charter amendment with on a petition. And we got a group of citizens together and just started pounding, you know, the neighborhoods, going door to door, getting signatures. And within 30 days, we collected enough to take it to the Board of Elections and qualified to put it on the ballot. So, you know, it, it, all along the way, it was funny. It was all a learning process. And some of it we didn't learn until hindsight as to why probably city council did what they did. So, you know, I'm not very, um, I guess... When I go to other communities now to talk to them, and they always want to go to their electeds, that's the first place they want to go. Right. I'm kind of skeptical, but, you know, every community, and I think everyone has to learn on their own. So I said, sure, go go try that route, see how it works for you. didn't work out so well for us. Um, then we had our campaign throughout the fall of 2012, and, of course, the city mayor, the um, law director, they were very, very vocal that we should not, residents should not pass this. So they've never been in support of it. We, again, only then at that point, lost one of the council members in the November election as well. So um, it was a hard fought battle, but 67% of the residents in Broadview Heights in 2012 voted to approve the Community Bill of Rights. Um, at that point, you know, we were elated. Right. For two years, we didn't have a new well drilled in the community and we had we were averaging between 15 and 20 new wells being drilled prior to the passage of the bill of rights so you know we thought oh we won this is great we thought we were going to be challenged and no challenge came right away but then in um, 2014 it was june i believe of 2014 is when two drilling companies sued the city um, over our bill of rights claiming, of course, illegal, unenforceable, and they had state permits from our state um, saying, yes, they could come drill in our community. What they, you know, you hear a lot of times, too, people will say things, why you shouldn't pass your own law in your own community protecting yourself, because they'll say, you're going to cost your community money. You know, you're going to bankrupt your community. Yeah. Well, what was really interesting is these two drillers sued the city, but they weren't asking for any monetary damages. All they were asking the court to do was overturn our Bill of Rights, people's past law, overturn it and make it null and void. Right. Um, so at that point, what we wanted to do was we offered free legal services from the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund at a council meeting to the city, said Seldoff will defend the Bill of Rights at no charge to the city. And um, what was really shocking to us is the city said no. <laughs> so again, it's been a learning process all the way through. I'm like, why wouldn't the city want this? Well, the city obviously just was playing along, I think, politicians again. Um, they realized we're all voters and they were kind of backed into a corner. 67% of their voters at this point had approved this law, wanted it. So they had to make it look like they were putting on a defense, but they didn't really want to go into the territory of the waters, I guess, of the rights, the rights of the people um, to prohibit this activity in our neighborhoods. So they defended it on a strict basis of home rule, the municipality's home rule authority. Right. So at that point, what we did as the citizens, we tried to intervene in that lawsuit. We actually wanted to become a party 
to the lawsuit sure because we wanted to make our case about our rights our right not only to clean air and clean water but our rights as people to be able to self-govern our community and that we p proposed this law we did all the work we passed it by a majority of the citizens of the community and um that we wanted to be in that lawsuit to defend it well next you know you guys in lafayette i think colorado have a similar story we got denied intervention right the judge the judge actually said in denying our intervention that we had no stake in the case <laughs> and that the city would do a fine job of defending our our bill of rights which in the end that was totally not true i mean even though in our intervention we presented all kinds of evidence of them speaking out vocally against our bill of rights um, in media publications and that and I laughed I said why would you wanted to go into court with someone defending your Bill of Rights who from the beginning has never supported it and said it's illegal and unenforceable um, judge obviously didn't agree with us so at that point we were faced with a decision you know do we appeal our the, the ability to intervene or do we just do a class action try to go on the offensive I guess and we bring our own lawsuit as plaintiffs not defendants against the state and the drillers and everybody else for violating our rights um, we decided and it's really interesting later in the story last week we actually did get into a courtroom for the first time and one of the judges actually asked that question and said why didn't you intervene or appeal the you know the lack of intervention and I, I wanted to, you know, scream out in the courtroom, but I wasn't allowed to. We don't have unlimited resources. You know, the people, unfortunately, don't have the checkbooks that the corporations do. And so, you know, everything when you get lawyers and go into court costs money. And so at that time, our lawyers told us, they said, the reality of the situation is the appeals court is so backed up that what will probably happen is the initial lawsuits that the drillers brought against the city will get decided before your appeal actually ever even gets heard. Yeah. So, you know, at that point, you're kind of like you're weighing all the options. And so we decided, well, that doesn't seem like a good use of resources. And what we should probably do is just bring our own lawsuit on the offensive because then we're automatically a party. We're bringing the lawsuit. So that's the reason why we then filed a class action lawsuit against the governor of the state of Ohio, the Oil and Gas Association, and the two drillers trying to sue, or trying to drill in our community. Um, again, you know, our state government, our governor and the attorney general's office, who again is supposed to be representing the people, immediately filed motion to dismiss our case. And then the drillers jumped on that bandwagon as well. And they uh, pretty much, you know, some of the phrases they use in their brief or their motion to dismiss were kind of shocking again. Um, they said things like the state of Ohio put in their brief that we were mere interlopers, meaning the people, interfering in affairs of the state. Right. Where we didn't belong. And, you know, to us, that was still shocking. And it's amazing, though, because it's actually good in a way because you can use some of what they actually say because it points out how little they really think of the people. You know, they've yeah. given first all the rights over to the drilling corporations and how little they really believe in our right as the people to a democracy to be able to write our own laws. The whole focus of their brief pretty much was we don't have the right to do this because the state has passed laws giving the drillers the right to do this. And so it just kind of, you know, reinforced everything that we had learned along the way in the two years from the time we passed the Bill of Rights until this point in court. And that's that, you know, the people pretty much have been stripped of their rights by right. a legislature, which it's interesting because along those two years, you know, of course, you find out things about how much money is given in lobby money, campaign funds to these legislators from this particular industry that's destroying our community. And, you know, so then you kind of start figuring out and you go, well, wait a minute. They're not really representing our best interests. They're representing the drillers' best interests. And so it was kind of like a big 
like jigsaw puzzle, I guess. And the pieces all started fitting together after two years. And in the meantime, you're learning all these facts about how dangerous what they're doing is in your community. Yeah. I mean, we actually got an infrared camera. We couldn't afford the people again. It always comes down to money, right? We couldn't afford to get an infrared camera on our own. So a bunch of communities in Ohio pitched in and we brought in this gentleman from New York State who had an infrared camera and flew him in. And he came around to the various communities. And, you know, we found a couple of the wells in Broadview Heights because he couldn't obviously stay for days. We only had maybe like an hour with him. And um, one of the wells right next to the baseball fields where the kids, you know, play. It was between the baseball fields and the soccer field. When he shot, held that infrared camera up to it, you look at it with the naked eye, there's nothing coming out. But when he held the infrared up, all kinds of plumes of smoke coming out of this, which now we know are probably, you know, volatile organic compounds, things that are caused cancer causing. And here we have our kids running around baseball fields, breathing in deeply, and this is being emitted into the air. So, you know, along the way, it's a learning process of what's actually going on. Our community suffered in those years prior to passing the Bill of Rights. We had a well next to a playground in an elementary school something on it went wrong while the kids were outside at recess it started emitting a gas water mixture is all it said in the report from the fire department out of it some kind of pulley or bearing something broke on it while the kids were out there and the wind blew it towards the playground so they had to do a um get the kids inside and do a 911 um reverse call and that's the only way anyone even found out about it. The media never covered it. It's still not on the state website that it ever occurred. We only got a small write-up from the fire chief at that point of what had occurred. But things like that, we had um, 200 gallons of oil leak from a well in the next community over, and it, but it flowed into Broadview Heights, 200 gallons of oil into the Chippewa Creek, which that's a tributary that flows into Lake Erie. Um, we had evacuations, home evacuations, because during the drilling process of some of these wells, residents in these neighborhoods would smell unusual smells. They would get upset. They'd call the fire department, and the fire department would come and evacuate the homes. Right. This would be maybe 10 o'clock on a school night. You know, I mean, this isn't what's supposed to be happening in residential neighborhoods. And the court then is telling us that we have no stake in this. We're mere interlopers, and yet we're the ones that are facing all these harms, you yeah. know, and I kind of, it made me think of, you know, Love Canal, and I don't know how many people are familiar with what happened in Love Canal, but that affected me a lot when I was um, in high school and then in college, because that was around that time, and I actually did a paper on it, and, you know, those people had to, had their homes built on top of a toxic, you know, site, and the government knew that toxic site was there, and yet they let these schools and developments of homes be built on top of it. And it wasn't until how many years later that people started noticing they had high rates of cancer, they had birth defects. So I said, in other words, what you're, the court's telling us here in Broadview Heights is we need to sit back in the state and just watch them put the poisons into our air and into our soil and into our water and sit back now and wait for the cancer clusters and the birth defects to occur. And that's totally unacceptable to me and yeah. a lot of the residents here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the interesting fact is that the courts consider that your community has no stake in the issue, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And, and the story you're telling me is that it really seems like you might have a stake in the issue. You, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it's really interesting in the regulatory system, you know, how they have hearings. Oh, yeah. And uh, so they'll have a hearing and they say the hearing is with all the stakeholders, mm -hmm, yeah. you know, and, you know, I never thought about this, but in court, you you have you do or do not have a stake in the matter. Mm -hmm. All right. But then when you're told about the hearing and the hearing involves all the stakeholders, typically it's just the big polluters that are the stakeholders. <laughs> Exactly. And they're like, and they're government allies. Right. But and some it, of the big it, environmental groups, too, are considered stakeholders. Right. And they're, you know, so they're supposed to be representing you, you know, and your little community. I mean, you know, we have little communities around here, too. And 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 those big environmental groups want to come in and pretend to represent the people that live there. Right. You know, 
and yeah. and so you, they get to be on at the at the at the at the table making negotiations so to speak for the people that really never elected them or even gave consent that they be their stakeholders right what's really interesting is we put together a curriculum because i should tell you my my life has changed a lot in the last 5 years it and seems I, like it yes, I do. <laughs> I did have a re a job in a school system here, and you know, I had worked there for 13 years. Then, when this all came along, um, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund had offered me um, if I wanted to start organizing in Ohio a part time position, which I jumped at then because once I realized what was going on, that evolved into a full time position. Which then I had to quit at the school. Um, I'm doing this now. I'm the Ohio organizer for the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund currently. And um, also what I've gotten involved is we formed the Ohio Community Rights Network in 2013. So I'm also involved with that organization. And that's parallel to what you have in Colorado with the Colorado Community Rights Network. So, right. you know, all this evolved along the way. But I started out just pretty much like every other citizen, believing that our government is there to protect us, believing mm -hmm. that our legislators represent us, and believing that... The regulatory agencies like the Ohio EPA and the federal EPA, that they're looking out for us. And what you find out along the way is that that's so not true. And so we actually developed now a curriculum for a state um, community rights workshop. And one of the things we put in there is a case study to show people exactly who the stakeholders are in any of these particular, you know, hearings that go on in events, whatever that, because this isn't just drilling, this is how this works, no matter what the harm is. Um, yeah, the claim. The case study, yeah, the case study the, we did is, I'm sorry, is about the regulatory. The, the claimed stakeholders. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, we need to define who the stakeholders really are, and it's the people most impacted by whatever the activity. And, oh, it's and, and and right now we look at our communities and we say, boy, it's making us sick. It's ruining our culture. It's right. it's tearing up the economy. It's destroying our way of life. We feel like we're really most impacted by this project. But the corporations and the government look at it and they say, you're not impacted at all. The people that are impacted are the people that have a chance to make, you know, a huge fortune. Right. doing all this destruction. They're the only stakeholders. That's right. And you start out thinking you're, a, of course, you're a stakeholder. It's your community. Yeah. I mean, that's just you just assume that. Right. And as you go through this process, you find out you're not. So the case study we have is about um, radioactive drill cuttings. And what's really interesting, we have documents in there how the law is passed by the state. And first, what they do is give exemptions to all the people in it, in the industry that they don't want to have to have, follow any of these regulations. That's the first thing they do. Then we have a document in from a big environmental group in the state of Ohio who's a stakeholder. Right. And at the end, they point out all these harms of these radioactive drill cuttings, but at the end, their very last sentence says, but we will continue to follow whatever laws and regulations the state of Ohio tells us to follow. Right. So that's where the point is. They're a state, but they aren't going to do anything. And then we have in their actual letters written to our state EPA from the actual drillers and the lobby group itself stating exactly what they think should be done with these drill cuttings. They say they will help write the regs and that they will help write the permit even. Right. So, you know, it's to try and wake people up and show them that this is not at all about these organizations and these regulatory agencies are not protecting us. They're protecting the industry. And it's really just part of a big scheme and it's part of a big illusion to keep us thinking that they're protecting us. Right. You know, and that's part of it's really like hard and it's I get it. It's hard for people to absorb this. It's kind of like having the rug pulled out from under you. Well, it's like I living guess. in, you know, upside down world because, you know, you think the regulatory agency is there to protect you. But then you realize that its main role is the promotion of the industry, which it is regulating. And then you find out that the regulations are actually written by the industry. Exactly. And and so then you think, well, and then like for instance here in Colorado, we have an oil and gas act that was passed similar to yours, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And you read the thing and there is one mention there about the role that that agency plays in protecting the health, safety and welfare of the public. 
But as far as I know, they've never acted on that at all. All they really do is promote the, you know, extraction and of and transportation and everything associated with oil and gas exploitation in Colorado. Well, exactly. It's the same everywhere. And they'll throw out at you, they'll say things like, oh, no, we have the strictest regulations in the state. That's, where yeah, they say we that here, state, too. Right? We have state-of-the-art monitoring. Well, here right. we were in Broadview Heights living and all, all over the, the state and all over the country. I mean, you see it just now in California with that methane leak. State-of-the-art monitoring. And yet they didn't know that that methane was leaking out of that pipe and they can't stop it. Right. They have no way to stop. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Let so, me ask you a question. Yeah. Okay. Did your oil and gas industry and state allies tell you guys that they have the strictest regulations in the country? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. They told you that? Oh, that's exactly they what they told said. us the same thing. So right. how can we both have the strictest regulations in the country? Exactly. Do they say that to everybody? Yes. Okay. And we all believe it. We all believe it. Hook, line, and sinker. But then, like, even in Broadview Heights, I had to laugh. I go, there was 200 gallons of oil leaking into a creek, and guess who found it? Oh, a resident. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> is it clear to you, as it is to me, that, um, that regulations are actually, um, they're actually permits mm -hmm. for these harmful practices? They actually permit them. They make them legal. Right. There's like no when you write a regulation that you're going to be able to do something up to a certain amount of particles per million, you're actually legalizing the, the pollution up to that level. Right. And that's exactly what you see like in the lawsuit that we've had in Broadview Heights. When you read the state's um, briefs and the drillers briefs, that's exactly what they say. And that's what the judges have decided. They say right in there they're not doing anything illegal because they have a permit from the state. So they're following the law. What they're right. doing is perfectly legal. That's exactly what they say in the legal briefs then. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, so now you all filed your appeal, right? And actually you, you did a class action lawsuit, I mean, right? Well, we did our class action lawsuit, right? And so then I, I got that far in the story where then the um, state filed a motion to dismiss again and the right. drillers to the court saying we had you know no legal standing to do this and we had no reason because it's already been decided in the right. other case um, of Broadview Heights because of course the judge in that case did rule that our Bill of Rights was overturned and that the drillers had the rights yeah so they used that and the first judge yes ruled that our Bill of Rights and our class action you know no merits to it so yes, we appealed obviously right. that decision because again his decision it was so it was only like three paragraphs and it was all about preemption again and that the drillers have the right to drill and the state you know has the right to issue these permits nothing about the people's rights. Yes. So we actually did for last week which we were shocked because even in our initial class action the judge denied any oral arguments in the right. case. So in other words he just was going to decide it based on reading the legal briefs. Right. Um, so we never felt like we ever got in the courtroom, having been denied intervention in the first one, denied oral arguments in our class action. So we couldn't get in even a big toe, as I tell people, into the courtroom, <laughs> let alone a foot. We right. couldn't get anywhere near it. Um, so this, we had an appeal actually last week, and it was in front of three judges, and we actually did get our foot into the courtroom, which was interesting. Um, and what's interesting too is we have one lawyer on the people's side versus there was 10 from the Oil and Gas Association, the state of Ohio, and the drillers. So not exactly a fair fight. So what the Ohio Community Rights Network did, it was kind of cute. They um, It said, well, wow, that's like a David and Goliath story, isn't it? And we said, yeah. And so that evolved into a street theater production, which we had about 30, 35 residents who came and did in front of the um, courthouse last week when we had our oral argument. So that was kind of fun. We try to have fun sometimes with this. Um, <laughs> did get into the courtroom and learned a few things about, you know, and I'm still learning. So five years later, I'm, I'm still amazed. But the way this works, I've never been in an appeals court, is that each side is allotted 15 minutes to right. make their arguments. But part of that 15 minutes are the judges can interrupt and ask questions. And that actually counts against your lawyer's 15 minutes to present his arguments. 
So in all, I would say our lawyer maybe got to talk five out of the 15 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting. And, and you, you, you look at the courts and you wonder how many of those justices are corporate lawyers mm -hmm. and how, how much uh, alliance they already have with the very corporations that are, you know, trying to sue your community. And well, really interesting little tidbit that we learned right before the case is one, because it's the appeals court is three judges here. And one of the judges actually lives in Broadview Heights. Ah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was very interesting. Yeah, so, so he's thinking. So uh, that that's interesting. So there is a really good um, oral argument that I have read. It's a it's an outline of an oral argument given by the Broadview Heights Community Rights Movement's uh, lawyer, mm -hmm. Terry, and um, he, Terry has agreed to do an interview with me. So very soon I'm going to hook up with Terry, and we're going to go through the. Um, the reasoning behind why it's uh, totally constitutional and totally legitimate for communities to have the right to self-government and the right to write their own laws to protect their people from the harms of these big corporate projects. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a fascinating interview and uh, I, I'm looking forward to that really. And uh, yeah. So, yeah, so he only had five minutes to protect, to to present this entire argument, but let me just say something here now. That I think is the first time in history that uh, anyone has able, been able to bring up the fact of community rights, of these, mm -hmm. to really be able to present to the court in a legal argument that people have inalienable rights. <laughs> right, and that we have more rights than the claimed rights of corporations. What was interesting was the 15 minutes of the opposition, they split between a, one lawyer for the state, which actually our state of Ohio brought in a lawyer from Texas, which was interesting to yeah. for them. And then we, the drillers actually had a lawyer get up. And what we were really surprised by, because we didn't think she would go there, but she did. She actually said in her argument to the three judges that we all know that corporations have the right to drill in Broadview Heights. And I didn't think she, you know, I was thinking, I thought, nah, I don't think they'll go there, but they did. But what was too bad is there wasn't enough time then, because we have time limits, right. for Terry to then go, you know, take that argument on full steam like you would in a regular trial court. Right. You know, but it, it, that's really interesting because that's why we want to get into the courtroom. We want the court to address this. Who has more rights, corporations or the living people, the living, breathing people and the environment of that community? Right. Now, I would like to um, make sure that everyone understands the definition of a community bill of rights. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to go into intricate detail, but you know, it's a, it's a real revolutionary concept in the sense that it, it kind of takes up where the American revolution left off, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, we, we had a revolution because we wanted local community self-government. We wanted to have our own laws that would not be preempted by a king. You know, we wanted to break away from the feudal system. We didn't like the idea of totalitarian government. We didn't want to have people at some, you know, Mecca, some, some castle somewhere like Washington, D.C. telling us what we have and can, can and can't do. We wanted to do what's best for the good of the whole and not for the few, all right? And so that's our history. But after the Constitution was written, actually the right for corporations, the, the ability for corporations to claim rights that are superior to the living people in local communities, that opportunity became manifest. And in a sense, it was sort of a counter-revolution to what was going on, you know, before uh, the the uh, current Constitution of the United States. So, it, you know, what I'm seeing is that the Community Bill of Rights being adopted locally is, is right in alignment with where we started out. 
when, oh, exactly. we, when we really formed our country, you know? Right, full circle. And it's it's interesting because, you know, people say that to me and I go, well, wh you know, that's what we did here when we were going around and campaigning. And now as I travel to other communities in Ohio that are fighting because they have injection of waste under them or pipeline projects and compressor stations and all these things and, you know, radioactive drill cuttings going in, is that, you know, how, why is this so radical for you to believe that the people who are going to be directly affected by these harms can actually pass laws democratically by a majority vote in their community to protect themselves. And it goes back to the part where we say all power is inherent in the people. Well, if that's true, we are the people. And then the other part of that, that's we're, it's all ingrained in us, is that we the people have the right to alter, reform, or even abolish any form of government that's no longer protecting our health, safety, and welfare. Right. Well, we're experiencing firsthand our health, safety, and welfare being impacted negatively. We've gone to our government. Our government is not protecting us. It's protecting the very corporations that are doing the harm. So that is our inalienable right, right there. They're yeah, interfering yeah. with our life, and we have the right to alter and reform and even abolish our government. So that's what we're doing with the Community Bill of Rights when we pass it. That's how I look at it. It's us doing that altering and reforming because we need to alter it to change so that it is protecting our health, safety, and welfare. Now, those rights actually are, we consider them inalienable, you know, which means that they supersede all governmental granted rights. Mm -hmm. um, but they're actually encoded, I know in Colorado, those rights are encoded in the Bill of Rights section of our state constitution. In Ohio's too. In Ohio's too, see? Mm -hmm. So what we're not doing anything radical, right. you know? We're doing something that's just completely written in law. It's just conventional if we were to look at it 200 years ago. Right, but the you thing know? is, is for 200 years, corporations have been getting the system, the courts and the legislatures and all that, to grant them more and more rights. Yeah. So right now we're at a place where they actually, in case law and in laws passed by the state governments, have more rights than the people themselves. Yeah. And so that's what we're trying to flip with these bills of rights, because there's always a clause, a section in each one of them that says, if you pass this in your community, the people have more rights than the corporations coming into your community. Right, so tell us what rights uh, the Broadview Heights Community Bill of Rights uh, a Charter Amendment, what are the inalienable rights that were, that were claimed and clarified and enumerated there? Can you explain what what the Bill of Rights, what yeah, those rights are. Yeah, I don't have it all are. in front of me, so it's like, but we, the basic ones that we have the right to clean air, to clean water, to peaceful enjoyment of home, Right. Um, that we have the right to local self-government. You know, and people always say to me, well, I thought those rights were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'll go, well, if they're polluting your water and killing you or your air, aren't they interfering with your right to life? You yeah. know, pursuit of happiness, most people look at their pursuit of happiness is their home, their family where they choose to make that home and that, you know, they make a huge, most average folks, their biggest investment is in their home. Right. So for most people, that's their pursuit of happiness. I said, they're now interfering with that. Yeah. So, you know, people just don't think of it. You have to kind of like, you know, get people to reframe some of this and think about it in a different way. Um, and that's what I'm hoping. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in Broadview Heights. We don't know what's going to happen with this lawsuit. Right. But, you know, we've moved on and Broadview Heights is kind of just, I use it now as an example because I am the state organizer now to show other communities. I mean, this is a path, right? a different path, off the path that they want us to follow. And just like you had mentioned, Tom, you know, like the regulatory system says, okay, the EPA will say, well, you can have this many picocuries of radiation in your water. And then I'll go and ask people, I'll go, how many picocuries of radiation do you want in the water you're drinking out of your tap? And they'll go, well, none. <laughs> I go, well, that's not what the EPA says. The EPA says you can ingest this much. And guess what? If those limits get kind of too high for industry to meet, they'll just raise the limits. Right. And the thing is, who is the authority on the quality of your life, your, mm -hmm. you know, your, your community? Who is, who's the authority? Is it the EPA? Yes. Are they the ones to determine? It's like in our community here uh, where I live. I, I mean, who gets to determine what the standards are for 
traffic congestion and how many changes of the light you have to wait before you can get where you want to go, all right? Mm -hmm. The changes of one light, all right? Mm -hmm. Who gets to determine that? Is it the uh, traffic engineer for the city or is it you, your community? Who knows best what's best for your community? And right. that's really what it comes down to. And who gets to tell you what's best for you? Well, and that's the whole point. And the thing is, too, I don't know if you, what we'll say a lot of times is like a lot of people now, the key buzzword is sustainability. Right. You know, we all know there's things like climate change going on out there and we have to, you know, sustainable farming, sustainable energy, sustainable, whatever, renewable energy, all this stuff. But who's setting, you know, the rules on that? Our state of Ohio actually rolled back our same state legislature, our renewable energy standards a couple of years ago. So, you know, they said, no, we're not even going to meet those. And they were really bare bones minimum to start with. Well, that was, again, because the industry, through lobbyists, got them to roll those back. Right. So we don't have the, you know, we're not making those decisions. And I say to communities, I go, how can you have a sustainable community if that's what you choose, you want to live in, and you're, the residents there want that, if you can't stop the unsustainable activities? Well, and not we only have, that, but if you decided that you wanted to pass standards that are higher than those of the state's mm -hmm. standards for sustainability. In other words, you actually wanted to legalize, you know, or en enact uh, uh, an entire, you know, plan to create sustainability. That yeah. would be deemed illegal by the state in which you exactly. live, you know, exactly. because it violates the, 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 the regulations that were set up by the corporations to, uh, for them to be able to operate. Exactly. Yeah, so basically what's happening is the regulatory system outlaws sustainability. And in mm -hmm. your case, the regulatory system outlaws democracy. Exactly. Because you elected those local laws democratically based upon your inalienable rights. You established exactly. those in law. And the other interesting thing is that I'm assuming, like we did here in Lafayette, Colorado, you banned fracking and all the associated corporate right. practices on right. the basis that that industry violates the community's inalienable rights. Exactly. And, and those rights are encoded in a charter, which is a constitution for the city, right. which is a, a constitution which has greater authority than the regulatory agency's regulatory laws. And it's founded, that whole right is founded in your state constitution in the Bill of Rights section, which is the supreme law of your state. Well, exactly. And then you don't have a stake in the matter and you have no voice in court to stand up for those rights? No, well, it's again because they've crafted this whole system to work to their benefit and not to ours. And, you know, I always laugh because I go, they'll send you and say you have to change this at the state level well most people think you know because they get all tied up then in this electing we have to elect the right people right so the problem is the system set up i mean i don't know about in colorado but here in ohio usually the one with the most money is the one who wins well right. where do they get their money from they get it from the corporations and the corporate lobbyists and all that so i mean donald trump even said it in his very first debate didn't he he came right out and told the people he said hey i write checks to all the people on this stage and then so, whichever one gets elected, that's the one that I go to and ask for favors. I mean, I call in my chips. So, you know, that's how the system's working. So when you go back to our Constitution that says the people have the right to alter, reform, or abolish, well, the altering and reforming, how can you go to the legislature if they're owned, corporately owned, and ask them to make the changes to give you the rights. They can't, they're not going to alter that system. They're being bought by the corporations that have created this system. So it's kind of a futile attempt. You wind up in this hamster wheel that you can't get out of. Right. And electing the right people, people will go, we got to get this person elected. And I go, I don't think they're bad people, but the way the system's set up, yeah. they're then beholden when they get elected to, and it's not you. <laughs> it's a so systemic it's problem. Yes. And right. wasn't it Einstein's that said you can't expect the solution to the problem to come from the same people that created the problem? Exactly. And that's and, what yeah. people, you know, but and that's our, it's a systemic problem. Yeah. And, you know, the, the thing that I wanted to point out is, and I, I just like to have full transparency here, and, and uh, you know, the community rights movement is about changing the entire system, really. 
We right. want to take a system that's geared for colonial exploitation. You know, you understand the history of this country and the foundation of our current constitution. The sl wealthy slave owners and who had uh, greater representation than the non-slave owning, you know, states uh, pretty much dominated the and, and the wealthy people from non-slave holding uh, states had a huge interest in in protecting their property mm -hmm. and protecting their commerce. Okay, and so they they wrote a constitution that gives that ability to take place in, in, in an unimpaired kind of way. And that's how the regulatory system got started. And the regulatory system as a foundation for government, as a foundation for law, basically is set up to, it, it would be said that our laws are based upon exploitation. You know, the, the early People in this country, the colonists and the and the the generations immediately following the intense colonization of this country, looked at the environment and they said, "There's all these quote resources for us to exploit. We can get that timber. We can get the wildlife. We can get the minerals. We can get the you know we can grow crops and all sorts of stuff." And and so they just set the whole thing up for westward colonization of the United States. And right. so All our sense of making money. Yeah, and our whole government is set up for, you know, for for property, for the ownership of nature, for the exploitation of nature, for the exploitation of people. It's all exploitation based. And yeah, what, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you heard the other night at the Golden Globes, Leonardo DiCaprio accepting his acceptance speech. And when he talked about the indigenous people, you know, with the movie and he said, it's about time, you know, they indi we realize that the indigenous people have had their lands exploited for corporate interests. And I kind of chuckled, you know, right. listening to him. And I'm like, well, he needs to know that it's not just the indigenous people. It's now in our communities. It's in Broadview Heights. It's in Lafayette. That's what they're doing. They're exploiting. Right. It's our oh, little it's our little towns and cities and right. neighborhoods. It's like we're the we think we're the indigenous people, you know, and we're being exploited, you well, know. We we well, are. yeah, we're kind of indigenous, but I mean, we're also you know, known by the original indigenous. Oh, no, I meant the part where we're being exploited. We're for being exploited, but the original right. indigenous people still consider us colonists. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but we think we're indigenous because we have houses and property oh, no, and no. families and institutions yeah. you know that we hold dear to ourselves we have communities right but and it's come so, full yeah. circle so now the same thing that the college yeah. that did to them is right. now coming right into our communities well it's one of the difference. one of the jokes that people make is that the united states didn't have to necessarily be colonized by europe we colonized ourselves yeah. you know we moved here and colonized ourselves mm -hmm. but the thing that i wanted to make the point i want to make is that the whole thing is that really we need to uh, rewrite the enti entire narrative if we want to have sustainability, if we don't want to destroy everything that's dear to us, that everything that promotes life, everything about life, if we don't want to have that extinguished in our lifetime, what we really need to do is rewrite the narrative so that all of our laws, all of our government, all of our representation is, is based upon inalienable rights. I mean, if we don't give the right, the inalienable right to clean air and clean water and freedom from chemical trespass, the right to local self-government, and the right to defend those rights to everybody, to every local community, we can just kiss ourselves goodbye as far as I can tell. Because uh, if we don't establish those rights at the local level and then protect those rights in our state laws, and then make the constitutional changes at the federal level to, to create a new constitution that's based upon inalienable rights and not property and commerce. Right. We're screwed. Right. I mean, this is a paradigm shift, and it's about creating a movement. The community rights is actually a movement at its beginnings, and we need to get people to see this in a different way because... You know, and that's part of what Lafayette's about, what Broadview Heights is about. You know, we don't necessarily think we might 
win this particular court case. But that isn't the point. The point is showing other people in other communities another way. You know, and I had a conversation this week with someone we were talking about the Boston Tea Party. You know, we la I laughed. I said, well, that was, yeah, not just against the king. The, the colonists here were upset about that tax, but it was also against the East India Corporation. It was the king and the corporation working together, and the corporation didn't want to pay more taxes or the taxes. They wanted more profit. So the king said, well, it's okay. We'll have the colonists pay it. So that was really at the heart of that. But the fact that it wasn't just about them throwing the tea, it was about showing other communities and other people in other places like, hey, we don't just have to accept this. Right. We need to change. You know, I mean, every movement, and, and I tell people now, I said, we have to realize what we're living in is a corporate state. Yeah. We live in a corporate state, just like People 200 years ago lived in a slave state and women lived in, you know, over 100 years ago in a patriarchal state. And people in the 50s, 60s, you know, when the civil rights movement started, they lived in a racist state. Well, we have to realize first, and that's what we have to do at the beginning, is educate people that we live in a corporate state and what that means and that there's another way. We don't have to continue living in a corporate state. We can change it. We could disobey. Exactly. In fact, if our communities really do wake up and enact these community bills of rights, the entire community could disobey. And exactly. we could have community disobedience. Well, that's what I said. So and for Broadview Heights, no matter what happens, what we need, I go, this is not a time. If the, those three judges also rule against us, our only option at that point then is to appeal to the Supreme Court of the state. But they get to pick which cases they hear. Right. So we may not get heard. You know, And if I had to take my bets, I'd probably say they wouldn't hear our case. But um, so at that point, is it done? No. I said it's just like Susan B. Anthony going into the polling place, you know, even though she's not allowed to vote. Goes right. in and votes, she gets arrested, goes in front of a judge, and the judge rules against her. Was that the end of the story? No. <laughs> so it's like, obviously not. We needed lots. What it did is that incident woke more women up, just like Rosa Parks, just like the kids who sat at the lunch counters. It woke a lot more people up to the current state they were living under and why it needed to change. Right. So Broadview Heights, Lafayette, we should just be examples. And we don't need communities to back off then. What we need is hundreds more communities to say, hey, we're going to do what they did. Yeah. And that's the only way the change is ever going to start happening. How can people get involved? How can they get involved in Ohio? Right. Yeah. Well, the Ohio Community Rights Network is probably the best way to um, contact um, the Ohio Community Rights Network, which our website is ohiocrn.org. Um, and they can read a bunch of information there about what's going on in the state of Ohio. There's contact information. Um, I will be posting soon, hopefully, the briefs from the cases um, yes. on that site. They aren't currently, but I'm getting those up there. We have some video. We have a seven-minute video that describes Ohio, what's going on here. And then also people, if they're in Ohio, can contact me directly through CELDEF if they're interested in pursuing that in their own communities. And my email is just tish at celdef.org. That's C-E-L-D-F dot org. Okay. Right. Standing mm -hmm. for Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Correct. Yes. And uh, I would just like to say that, um, you know, go to the websites and donate. Donate your time. Donate your money. Yep. But before you go too far, find out about this, okay? It's the most exactly. incredible movement. And I would like to give a plug to probably the most life-changing event in my life, and that is the attendance at one of the democracy schools. Mm -hmm. Like our organizations put on these schools and we bring in instructors. Uh, the instructors are usually, well, I think they're always uh, people f from or very a attached to the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it's amazing because you find out the history of this country in terms of the people, right? you know, and, and you, you get to see how there's been this battle going on between the, the wealthy elites who wanted to reestablish British law in this country and, and have total domination over all decision-making over all domination over the people right 
and and the struggles that the people have have had to put up with over the years and now we see where we are we understand how we got where we're going and now we understand what we can do about it exactly i mean and we sit back and think you know like oh when like the epa gets you know created in 1972 or whenever that was that oh they'll take care of us now or the people who fought for workers rights you know that's another big area and then we think oh that it's all taken care of but what do we see in this country how workers are making less and less and getting more and more benefits taken away so it's always it never ends it's like those with the money and the power want to always accumulate more and where do they get it they take it from us and so we have to always continuously fight not only to maintain what we have but to keep you know because they take away all the time and so we have to really become aware of that and we stopped fighting for a long time i think yeah you know, and that's when this slipped away we weren't paying attention and so now we're in a really bad place i think so we need to get back into that revolutionary spirit and realize that it's us it's we the people now, I'd like to mention that we have a precedent for over 20 years, this movement's been going on, and we already have enacted probably over 200 community bills of rights in towns all over the United States. Yep. And what we're really interested in is having many thousands of them. Exactly. Because until people have the experience of what it means to self-govern, what it means to be the authority in your own quality of life, to have to be actually a stakeholder rather than you know having uh, wealthy corporations and their government allies mm -hmm. claim stakeholdership you know until we have that until we have that awakening um, there's not going to be any change in law the only way you can change the law is to challenge it exactly so you, you we do these bills of rights we start bringing the conversation out into the open right. we rewrite the narrative so that we understand, you know, what's going on and what we need to do about it. And uh, through more and more court challenges, for f through more and more public awareness, we'll get to the point where we could actually change state constitutions and federal constitution. Exactly. We could get to the point where we could rewrite the federal constitution. And, and right, and everyone talks about it like it's this sacred document that we can't touch. And it's like, no, even Thomas Jefferson said, you know, law and all that, it should be changed with each generation, you know, to reflect things. I mean, the country isn't the same, like you alluded to before, that it was this vast open area full of resources. Well, you know, with a handful of people. Well, guess what? There's a lot more people and a lot less open land and resources. And so we have to adjust, but our constitution doesn't reflect that now what right. we've become, you know, and so it, people just need to really get involved and pay attention. And yeah. I've even had, it's funny, I've had progressive people come up to me when, you know, I've had given talks throughout the state and they'll say things like, well, really? I don't know if I want the people making the decisions. Right. I don't trust the people. And I'm like, right now you're trusting outsiders. And I said, I'm not saying that people won't make mistakes. Of course, they might make mistakes, just like our legislators doing it. But if you're the one who's directly feeling the impact of that decision you make, you also then have the ability to be able to change that decision that you made, if you made an incorrect one, right? Because you're like, oh, maybe that wasn't so good. So now we need to adjust. But if you can self-govern and pass those laws, you'll make the needed adjustments. Yeah. You know, and other people will say things like, well, you can't have that's the other thing they'll say. Well, then that'll get too confusing, especially if I bring up things like gun control or um, I don't know what the other big one is, because we had that issue here. You know, then you'll have this patchwork of quilt, you know, quilt of laws, which right. no one will be able to know what's going on. And I'm like, well, that's just ridiculous. You can post things just like they post speed limit, different speed limits. You can be on the same road and depending community to community, it changes. I don't have a problem with that one. <laughs> the, nice, the nice thing about rights-based, and we're talking about inalienable rights-based community lawmaking, is that an inalienable right to clean air, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, enforcing that right doesn't hurt any person in the community. You know, it, no. it might hurt somebody if they're a big polluting corporation, you know, but what we find is that these big polluting corporations are things that the community doesn't want anyway. They're things that are forced upon the community. And if you're a corporation that has to rely on a, a state granted, quote, corporate power in order to be able to operate in a local community, you're probably doing something really harmful, you right. know? And so the point is, is that 
in, you know, establishing inalienable rights as the basis for law and governance is the thing which guarantees the greatest good for the most. You know, it is for the greatest good, is the great, the good of the majority rather than the minority. Well, and, and that's the, the point. The system of law say, now is set up right. for a minority, and the people that are making those decisions have created corporations to protect themselves from the liability, the responsibility for all the horrible things that their corporations do in their name. And right. in effect, it's just a small handful of people, a corporate board sitting somewhere far away from your community usually, who are making all the decisions about what's going to go on in their community. And they're using that limit, that, that shield, that wall of protection from liability so that they can do these horrible criminal things right. without being responsible at all. Yeah, and you see that playing out in Flint right now, Michigan, yeah. with the water. I mean, you know, they want to hold the government and everyone respect because they knowingly poisoned yeah. the citizens. And we have that, and you probably get that in Lafayette, about people who say, well, wait a minute, people signed leases, and don't they have the right because they own the property to sign a lease and do that? And I said, oh, sure, they have the right to sign a lease and make money on their property as long as they're not harming anyone else in right. the community. And I said, I've told people this, I said, if you can figure out a way to encase the ground so nothing gets into the neighbor's properties and if you can put a bubble over the top so none of the air pollution travels to anyone else to breathe in the community, then go for it. And said, what about sealing off your well so that it doesn't contaminate the underground environment? Right, that's what I said. If they could encase it underground somehow right. so that it doesn't seep, the chemicals don't seep no. anywhere else and an above ground. But you can't do that. So that just because you have the right to make money from your property doesn't mean you also have the right to pollute the lungs of the kids next door, next to the playground, and pollute the water that we all drink. Let me just make one quick point, and then we'll wrap this up. But I just want to tell a story. Um, Marily Mazza, who's the president of the Colorado Community Rights Network, did some research because she wanted to know where the mineral rights came from. There's a company here, Anna, Anadarko Oil, mm -hmm. that owns most of the most or all the mineral rights. Okay, right. so where did they get those rights? Okay, so she looked it up, and those mineral rights were uh, inherited because they are a subsidiary subsidy of a railroad company. And I'm trying to think of the name of the railroad, but it's the big one, whatever it is, probably the, you know, yeah. the Pacific, whatever, Oops, yeah. or whatever it is. I mean, but in any case, um, to encourage uh, railroad development, Abraham Lincoln granted the mineral rights to uh, Colorado, I think it is, to this railroad, which, um, you know, the Anadarko Oil and here, you know, has the rights to the to those has the mineral rights in Colorado. They didn't pay a penny for them. Right. You know, it's just a grant, you know. Or incentives, it, incentives for economic development, right? Right. And it was just, you know, some 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 basic thing was like the King of England, you know, granting uh, some some knight that, you know, was going to go and uh, and fight a war to to kill off the King of England's uh, uh, adversaries. He granted right. him uh, property, right. you know, and, and I mean, basically kind of it, he didn't pay for it. I mean, he did go and work for it. He killed a bunch of people, but you know, it's kind of like that here. And so we're, we're thinking that these guys have this, this right that they've earned, that they have invested in, that they've spent, mm -hmm. you know, tons of money to be able to have and all this kind of stuff. And those railroads made a killing, you know, right. and, and, and those mineral rights, they're there. And now they want to claim them because the oil and gas is just so, you know, so attractive. You know, it's just the last frontier, the last resource really for them to colonize at this point. And, and they're willing to come right up to the backyard of your hospital or your school. daycare center or your school or your church exactly. or your house. I mean, we make a joke about it, but... There's a little community here, Erie, Colorado, that's built on a landfill. Mm -hmm. Some of it, most of it maybe. But the landfill was originally from a long time ago before landfills were regulated, and it's full of toxic waste. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So people just dumped anything they wanted in there and they covered it up with a thin layer of soil and people have built a community there, all these homes, all these adorable neighborhoods. And so what's happening is that people are moving in there and, and you know, these nice little innocent families and they're buying homes on top of a toxic landfill with fracking in their backyard. Wow. You know, and that's really what's going on is that we are we're becoming we are actually resource colonies right. for these big industries. And yeah, if you don't have a voice, so that comes right back to our bills of rights. If you don't have a voice and can, are part of the decision-making process, then you are a colony. Yes. And so can you, again, explain how people can get a hold of you and the Colorado, not the, the excuse me, the Ohio Community Rights Movement so they can become involved. One more time. Sure. It's um, tish at celdf, C-E-L-D-F dot org is my email. And then um, the Ohio Community Rights Network is ohiocrn dot org. So that's our website. And Tish, I want to thank you so much for spending this time. I know that we went on and on about this. It's something I could go on for years about, I think. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and, you know, if you're, still, if you're still watching this, I want to thank you for, you know, putting up with our, um, with our lengthy conversation about this topic. But as you can see, we're pretty passionate about it. And, and we really would like to see, uh, you know, this whole systemic change take place in our lifetime so that we can really bring to the bring to a halt the destruction of the environment yeah. but also otherwise there won't be a planet for our kids and our grandkids and and you know and to give give people the awareness that they have inalienable rights and they're supreme and you know it, even if a, a court you know passes down an order that you have to allow these harmful practices in your communities, you actually have the, the legal and logical basis for, through community, right, community rights organizing, you, you have the basis for saying no. Right. You know, if your elected officials understood this, this whole history, this whole narrative of community rights, they could be given a court order to sign permits for harmful practices that would take place in their community and they could refuse. Yeah. It's actually that quote that we all hear all the time. We are the ones we've been waiting for, right? Yes. It's up to us to make the change. Well, thank you so much. And thank it's you, been a Tom. real pleasure. And yeah. I'm looking forward to talking to you again soon okay, and, and you meeting too. you in person. Yeah. yeah take, good luck out in Colorado and Lafayette. <laughs> well, thank you. We need it. <laughs> yeah. I know we all do. <laughs> take care. And bye-bye. Bye.